This podcast is a frank discussion on sexual assault. If you are in the USA for free and confidential help, please call 1-800-865-HOPE. If you are in Australia for confidential counseling and support in cases of sexual assault or abuse, please call 1-800-RESPECT. John Vaughn has spent a lifetime meeting challenges from a troubled childhood that included years of sexual violence to a spot on the famed University of Michigan Wolverines football team where John became a victim of repeated sexual abuse at the hands of athletic department physician Dr. Robert Anderson. Now, the challenges John faces include thyroid cancer, but more notable is his fierce focus on challenging the University of Michigan to acknowledge his and hundreds of other victims' sexual abuse and the institutional cover-up, which enabled Dr. Anderson to commit these atrocious crimes over the course of 40 years. This challenge, like all those presented before him, John is tackling head-on it is my honor and privilege to welcome this warrior for justice, John Vaughn, to Open Stance. Welcome, John Vaughn. Oh, thank you. From across the pond, as they say, right? That's it. I'm down here in Sydney, Australia. John, um, where are you today? I am in L.A. Um, kind of bittersweet. Uh, especially with all that happened this weekend, but I'm here to tomorrow and then flying back to Ann Arbor. All right. What are you doing in LA? Can you tell us? Yeah. Uh, we are in the middle of shooting a TV show that is internationally syndicated. Um, this is kind of our, you know, secret weapon appearance uh, in this fight. Uh, more to come uh, as we get closer to uh, the air date. Uh, this one is, this one we want to be a, a massive surprise to the Michigan administration. Exciting. Um, all right, John, if we are reading about you in the newspapers these days, we're reading a lot about the University of Michigan. We're, re uh, we're reading about you as a survivor of sexual abuse at the hands of Dr. Robert Anderson, uh, the former physician at Michigan. Um, we know you as a star running back for the University of Michigan and a former NFL player. And we know that recently, you have come out publicly to say, I am not John Doe, I am John Vaughn. John, can we open today and can you tell our listeners in 25 words or so, who is John Vaughn? Oh, wow. Um, father, activist, um, entrepreneur, um, creator of content, um, and currently, um, frontline fighter in the battle against the largest sexual abuse, rape, and cover-up in the history of sports. Powerful. Well, that leads us to the current news. So let's start with, you're in LA right now, but where have you been living, John, for the last 99 days? And uh, why have you been there? Wow. So, um, my address changed to uh, 815 South University, Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is right out in front of the University of Michigan's president's house um, in a protest against how the university has handled sexual abuse, sexual assault, student safety um, over the last 50 years. Uh, specifically, um, I decided to start this protest because there was a doctor that was allowed to 
prey on um, student athletes and other students for close to 40 years um, at the University of Michigan, giving an improper or unnecessary uh, medical exams, um, testicular cancer screenings, prostate cancer exams, and the like. Um, and then the university uh, office of the president and the board of regents uh, really uh, have been treating us very inhumanely, um, disrespectful, uh, trying to keep us faceless, voiceless, nameless, and um, you know, it got to a point where you were able to speak my name uh, when not only you recruited me, but when I played for you. And I was just unwilling to continue to be referred to as a Jane or John Doe, um, which is a very uh, isolating and dehumanizing process that massive organizations uh, tend to do when it comes to uh, villainizing victims that were either sexually abused or raped or taken advantage of within their um, organizational structure. Right. And when you look at, there's a report that surfaced in May 2021. Um, it was a 240 page report that came out of Washington DC, a law firm. Oh, well, yeah, the Wilma Hill report. Correct. And in that report, it acknowledged and revealed that they found it, they found that the university, including Bo Schembechler and high profile administrators were in fact aware of the sexual abuse the serial sexual abuse that was going on for over 40 years at your university. When you have a report that releases that type of information and you still have a university that will not come out of its front door, the president will not come out its front door, you still have players that back and believe Bo Schembechler. How does that make you feel? Um. You know, I think on a foundation level, I feel fine because I know I'm just telling my truth. And um, the university paid $11.9 million to write a report that told us as victims in this fight, you know, they didn't tell us anything new, things that we already uh, had known. But it also proved that internally, over 24 individuals over the course of Dr. Anderson's tenure from 1966 to 2003, knew of, enabled, or were either complicit in his predation of young men and young women, teenagers. Um, so, I don't get into too many debates about whether Bo knew or who didn't know. Um, it proved that Bo knew, but also so many other people knew. It's almost a situation where everyone knew. And um, so I don't get into debates about that um, because, you know, as a 51 year old man and looking at this as an adult, whether you knew or didn't know, this happened on your watch. And that's all coaches, from Gary Moeller to Lloyd Carr, who, you know, the two coaches that took over. I mean, this man was there from 1966 to 2003. Um, so the question of who knew, uh, who didn't know, who empowered, who enabled, who, you know, was complicit, at this point doesn't matter. It just matters that at every point, in which the university knew no one, this man was able to retire with his job, celebrated. So all that knew are culpable in, you know, uh, 
enabling uh, this predator to gorge on teenagers, young men and young women um, in an appetite that was never satiated. What, what's the most heinous of the crimes to you? The betrayal uh, of your team doctor or the betrayal of a coach who knew his players were being sexually abused and did not protect them and the university that you went to knew and did not think, protect you? Wow. Um, you know, I guess there's really no degrees of betrayal. I think it was all um, betrayal. But to subject young men and women under the guise of medical treatment to what clinically is described as rape. I was digitally raped. You know, let, simply put, I should have never had my first prostate exam at 18, and I should have never had 49 more before I left there at the age of 20. Um, and there were individuals at every turn that could have stopped this monster. I should have never met him because it was proven that every person in power from the time he got to that university, came on campus in 1966, till I got there in the fall of 1988, there were several times that I should have never met him and he should have been stopped and, it, and, it, and, it, and he wasn't. So, um, I don't, you know, so I don't really think much about the degrees of betrayal. Um, and in a, an atrocity such as this, it's not really, um, you know, everyone that has um, quote unquote uh, blood on their hands is a part of, you know, Michigan has become a syndicate of abuse. It is at the epicenter of the largest sexual abuse, rape, and cover up in the history of sports. And it is intimately tied to the other two greatest sexual abuse and rape scandals and cover ups in sport. And that is Larry Nasser did his student training at the University of Michigan in 1985 and set up his home similar to Dr. Anderson with the basement exam room. And a gentleman who's still employed at the university who was the assistant athletic trainer while I was there, who is now the number two person in the athletic program, Paul Schmidt, was the gatekeeper to Anderson. And then, oh, by the way, he did his residency under Strauss, the doctor at Ohio State. So when you look at that geographical location centered around the Big Ten, and um, we as survivors of each of those atrocities realize that the epicenter, the syndicate that has been created and the culture that has permeated itself throughout each of those institutions all centers around Ann Arbor and the University of Michigan and the enabled and empowered predator that Dr. Robert Anderson was. And that is exactly when you bring in Larry Nasser and you look at what the abuse at Michigan um, was. So in both cases, we see an extraordinary abuse of power and trust and authority at the levels of coaches, at the level of administrators, university, uh, an organization as large as um, USA Gymnastics. Um, victims are not believed, were not believed by their parents, by police, by the FBI, uh, students, your teammates, were not believed by their coach. So from an educational and a change perspective, when we teach our kids that you must tell an adult if something is not right and um, you are experiencing some kind of abuse specifically, and you're not believed by these people that we're told we can trust, where does that leave us, John? What, what? Oh. 
does that require for us <laughs> to do on such a grand level when these are the people that betray us? You know, one of the things that, um, especially uh, the, you know, let's say Chuck Christian and Tad DeLuca, who I probably spend more time with in discussing uh, this issue as Anderson survivors is we have to be honest, transparent, and vulnerable in so many ways about showing the world what the face of abuse looks like and being very honest and frank and descriptive about how under the guise of medical treatment with the pressure of playing big time college football, you know, I remember telling one of my best friends and teammates, uh, you know, and you know, we're talking as 50 year old men that we were in a constant state from the day I stepped on campus at the University of Michigan, I was in a constant state of being uncomfortable and being built and trained to thrive in a sport that is organized chaos. That is a pressure that most individuals will never understand. And coming into the University of Michigan, all your sights were set on becoming a Michigan man. It was achieving the recognition and the respect of your teammates and coaches of fulfilling the duty of a student athlete at the University of Michigan playing football to become a Michigan man. That's what you strove to achieve every day. And a Michigan man was a man that didn't ask questions, that did what he was told, that trusted the direction of every coach, trainer, doctor, and that this is what it takes because it's the Michigan way. It's the Michigan difference. And so first we've got to get real about the grooming and the gaslighting process that puts that pressure on 18-year-old young men whose brains aren't fully developed. And when everything is under the guise of when you've been recruited, this is the best, that's the best, the best medicine, the best training staff, the best coaches, the best facilities, the best dorms, the best food, the best, the best, the best, the best. Coming out of high school, you think that, and you're prepped beforehand, knowing that this is going to be at a level higher than anything else you've ever experienced. So it's all normalized in the process of becoming a Michigan man. So you never questioned it. There are some organizations out there now that are working around the clock to find ways to protect students and athletes specifically in the sporting world, finding safe spaces that actually work. Do we have any safe spaces out there right now for, for example, oh. young football players like yourself that are still going through the same system that when that you went through all these years ago? Is the system the same now? Do they have any safe space that they could go to um, in these extreme cases? You know, um, the process is so personal in that these coaches and recruiters come into your homes and they sit in front of your mothers and your fathers and they promise that they will take care of and protect your son or your daughter. And then once they leave, like in the case of Dr. Anderson in my time at the University of Michigan, I was forbidden to see any other doctor outside of the program. So I never saw my childhood pediatrician again once I stepped on campus. And we had to see Dr. Anderson from, for football and non-football injuries. Today, that's a little bit different at the University of Michigan because I've talked to a few current football players and they can go see any doctor. And they were shocked that we were forbidden or that we, like this doctor did what he has done. Um, but I think there's, you know, several things that need to happen. Mothers, um, 
you know, it, it's an interesting dynamic. And a lot of times the fathers are super excited. You know, you're going to this college and everything. And the mothers, they care about their babies. They're like mother bears. How was that in your family? Both. Was that, was that your was dad mom, excited and, and your mom, mother bear? Was definitely excited. Um, my mother was a teacher. Uh, my brother, my older brother of 14 months, uh, you know, was, you know, going to an Ivy League school. My mother cared about the education and housing and things about that would be on par with the environment that she created in our home. She wasn't, you know, she's like, you can play football anywhere. You can play whatever sport you want anywhere. But I need to know these things. And those were the things that as we move forward, parents have to be educated on the worst of what could be, which is obviously this Dr. Anna's situation and the best. And you must be, uh, stand your ground on asking the tough questions about everyone that will come in contact with your son or daughter at these institutions and, and within these programs. Background checks, um, any arrest records, any abuse in the past, whatever, because just as much as these coaches, recruiters, and organizations do background checks on you and your family life, you have the right to do it to them. No longer are we commodities that are just bodies playing for these organizations. Because the one thing, and I've always felt that, and some of the greatest coaches have even said that, I wouldn't be the great coach that I am without great players. So you can't have great organizations without the two-way street of, great players, and great coaches. So we do have values as individuals on these teams, and we must protect that value going in um, because the job that your parents have done up until you leave home to go to school should be recognized and should be valued. We are not objects. We are not, you know, um, in the scheme of things, we are humans. And we need to get back to understanding the value of human life, as well as it can no longer be a system as do as I say, not as I do as it pertains to the code of conduct mm -hmm. and the level of accountability that must be had at these organizations. It's very empowering to, to look at it that way. And to recognize as a as a student athlete that you're not a commodity. That's very strong and very important for people to get their head around and, and how much value you have going in there and to do your background check. I love, that's a, a really strong piece of advice and education right there. Uh, that, that actually leads us into um, another, uh, another area of issue and topic that I'm very curious about. Uh, it's come up quite a bit in your interviews uh, but very surface level stuff. And I just wanted to touch on it and dig a little bit deeper. Uh, the cover up of the university. I, I've read that Dr. Anderson, he started in 1966 as a physician there. He was treating certain students, but then there were allegations against him about sexual abuse and they were taken seriously to the point where he was fired. And then turned around and rehired by the university and repositioned in the university in a different area. Now, I know this to be the athletic department where you were an athlete. Can you tell us, John, what happened there? Well, the university, you know, made a conscious decision to limit its liability and take Dr. Anderson out of circulation or having access to the paying, more affluent and acumen student body. And they made a social, economic and racial decision to bury him within the athletic department, which during his tenure was majority African-American males. What percentage do you um, think? I'm, I'm thinking that it's somewhere between 55 and 75% uh, throughout his tenure uh, of the revenue driving sports. And so uh, let's put them with the young black athletes. Uh, 
you know, that was a conscious decision. There was a dramatic turn of having his access to a steady stream of victims um, that never satiated his appetite for abuse and rape. He had unfettered access and it was empowered because in that time that they fired him and rehired him, they also celebrated him in the annual report, which was signed off by the office of the president and approved by the Board of Regents. So the individuals that run universities signed off on this predator to be protected, which empowered him to a level of, you know, an atrocity unknown in sport. So when we talk about race and gender and the university making a conscious decision to reposition the doctor within the athletic department, looking after a large majority of African-American males. What does this say to our institution in relation to the systemic racism that we're, we have experienced in America from the beginning? And well, I mean, it goes to, in these circumstances. Yeah, I mean, it goes to, you know, the African American history in the United States has been one of we've been fighting to have a voice um, for 400 years. We've been fighting to be treated equal on different levels for 400 years. It also goes to if you look back at, you know, the beginning of slavery, we were livestock. We were a commodity that was traded on the stock exchange. And that's how athletes that were integral parts of the revenue and the success, you know, football is the marketing arm of these institutions. You don't see science labs being broadcast on Saturday afternoon in the fall. You see these massive football programs that are the marketing that brings the eyes to understanding. Most people decide to go to universities because they saw them on TV, unless they were like a legacy. But what attracts you know, the, the, you know, just like a Gap commercial, you know, what attracts you to Gap is because you see these commercials. It's all marketing. And so the marketing arm, which is then the revenue driver for most of these universities and funds so much of the athletic program is these big time college football programs. And so, um, You're more than just a number. And this atrocity shows you that for, you know, for the last 50 years, they've been mired in this sexual abuse, rape, and cover-up. That what you thought your value was at 18 to this university is completely polar opposite to really what it was. And... Um, the sad thing is until this culture of abuse, I mean, currently we have five of the 14 schools in the Big Ten that have been mired in these sexual abuse cases. You've got a case at LSU, you have a case at USC and Utah and, and all these other schools. So it is a culture um, that has permeated itself through the institution of college football. 
you have the NCAA, the Big Ten Conference, these conferences that don't, you know, the NCAA argued that they have no responsibility for protection of student athletes in cases of abuse, but yet they're there for the protection of student athletes. Mm -hmm. So there's all this hypocrisy. And what I call it is there's this level of smoke and mirrors and distractions and all of these, you know, phrases and terms that show that they actually care about student athletes, but they only care if you're out there on the field or on the floor or in the water um, making their money. Because we're talking about what essentially is rape. And the business and the profiting of, you know, off of young students. We just now got into an era where students can make money while they're playing. So their intrinsic value now becomes more than just the scholarship at the school. And it's interesting, you know, I've talked to several victims and I hope that, that kind of go off topic just a little bit, but We've talked to several victims um, at different universities and, and, and a friend of mine that I've gotten to know, he said he was from, you know, one of the Ohio State victims. He was like, you know, we didn't get a full ride scholarship. We actually had to pay a copay and our copay for being a scholarship athlete at that program during that time was being raped repeatedly. And so We're at a point where the past must be dealt with about the inhumane treatment of scholarship athletes, but just athletes in general. And we must be honest and open and have a dialogue about how African-American or students of color have been treated in these programs when the majority of their victims in this population fit that social, economic, and racial um, uh, uh, population. Yeah. So that, I guess, just to get a little bit more education out of this, this is incredible. Um, so you're looking at um, silence. Uh, here we go. So we know that one of the great weapons of sexual predator is silence, keeping their victims silent. <clears throat> As an African-American male playing football for the University of Michigan, your hopes and your dreams and an NFL career scholarship on the line. What what were some of the, the main or the most oppressive stigmas and barriers that you faced as an African-American male that you can talk to in terms of mm. opening conversation? How do you open conversations when, when you read about the many, many myths and stigmas that suffocate a victim of sexual abuse? How do you open yeah. those conversations? I mean, we have to get past the uh, taboo nature of sexual abuse, rape, mental health in ethnic cultures or ethnic populations. And we have to be, uh, you, you gotta have the hard conversations. Um, and, and the hard conversations of not only what happened, but how did it happen? How was it able how was the system, and that's why I call it a syndicate, because there was capital involved. How does the need for growth translate to the amount of abuse or the source of abuse? And then we need to understand the psychological grooming and the gaslighting that goes on. And I'll give you an example. The first time I ever heard the words, are you hurt or are you injured? As an 18 year old, 
was confusing. I was befuddled because if I'm injured, I'm probably hurting. <laughs> and, you know, that's a contradictory statement. Or am I hurt? Yeah, I'm hurt. But I don't know at what level maybe I'm injured or on the way to being injured and totally out. Because in at the time at Michigan, you didn't take plays off. If you weren't on practice, you couldn't contribute. If you can't contribute, you're forgotten. So you would learn these phrases like you can't make the club in the tub, meaning if you're in a training room on an ice tub and you're not practicing, what can you do for us? And so you have to make decisions that sometimes put your own personal safety and health at jeopardy because once again, you want to become a Michigan man. And that's typical in sports, like next man up mentality. There's always, like I said, we were constantly uncomfortable and being trained to thrive in this chaotic and barbaric sport. And so you have to have more emphasis on player health. We're at a time now where we can talk about mental health. We can talk about abuse uh, uh, um, in different um, ethnic cultures where before it was so taboo, you just wouldn't talk about it, you know. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that uh, Chuck, Chris, and Tad and I are trying to do is, and other men that are coming out and speaking are trying to finish the wheel of what the face of abuse looks like. But society as a whole doesn't want to accept that wrestlers and football players, and basketball players, and hockey players can be raped. Because if they come to that conclusion that they could be raped, these athletes, these warriors, then what could happen to me? And so I think there is a level of ignorance, an absence of knowledge of how these atrocities become atrocities because of the pressure that is put on a scholarship athlete to perform, to live up to his scholarship is daunting, especially for 18 year olds, you know, teenagers. Um, you start to make decisions under pressure that is completely best for the team and the organization and so many times not for yourself. I've practiced with 102 fever. I've played with 102 fever. Uh, you know, probably broke every finger in my both my hands. I wasn't a guy that missed practice unless it was completely necessary because you also play the game for the guys, the guys next to you, the guys in the locker room, and you don't want to let down your teammates. So you're constantly under the pr pressure to perform. And um, a lot of that is necessary to play high level sports. But I think, you know, and, you know, in these programs, you are molded into the shape of whatever is that program, whether it be Alabama, Florida, USC, Michigan, Notre Dame, right? You come in to play for that organization. You're not playing for your high school, you know, and usually there's a tradition that you're walking into and it's all about living up to the tradition. Um, you know, I never played in front of less than 105, 106,000 people at home in college. That's a city. Uh, for most people, after coming from probably never playing in front of 8,000 people mm -hmm. in high school, the amount of pressure is, you know, pressure bus pipes. Uh, and there's a lot of people that crumble under the pressure, uh, just in general. Now add on these extreme, uh, you know, blue blood organizations that are traditional winners. Michigan is the winningest program in college football in terms of wins. 
you're taught all of these things during a recruiting process. So the grooming process is day one of being introduced to these organizations. And it's a, it's a great system, right? It's a great marketing tool to get your brand out there. You know, like it's our way and you show the difference because it's so competitive in the in the recruiting market. But we're still talking about boys and girls, teenagers. Um, very impressionable. Um, you have this unyielding desire to not only be accepted, but to be accomplished within these programs. And Failure and pain and selfishness is not an option. Like you are pushed to the extreme level of your capabilities at every turn. And then not only do you then have to go perform in the class, <laughs> you know. Got to keep your um, grade point average up, <laughs> keep your scholarship. Average up. You have to, you know, um, be a model student and a citizen. You have to represent the school well. And so you're constantly under pressure. You know, I don't think I've ever was comfortable a day in my life while I was at the University of Michigan. And although I loved it and I learned to thrive in that environment, I mean, I love pressure, um, but it's not normal. I mean, it's, it's not normal. I mean, back in those days, you had to wear your helmet the whole practice. You couldn't drink water for three hours. That makes you soft, you know? There were all these stigmas of what being tough was. You had to show you were tough. You had to play hurt, you know? That's something uh -huh. you just said in, your, in this conversation. You, you touched on how uh, the myths about men can't be raped, football players can't be raped. You hear it? I hear it all the time when people are listening to stories like yours from afar and they don't have their finger on the pulse. Well, wasn't that guy a big football player for the University of Michigan? How did he let that happen to him? Can you please speak to this and speak to the myths and the stigmas that surround that comment? Um, well, first of all, that's a comment of sheer ignorance. Most of the people that say that never played big time college football or big time college athletics. And two, at the age of 18, we had been groomed to respect people in power and to trust people in power. Respect your elders, respect your coaches, respect doctors. Um, and so if everything that you are introduced to, let's just say within the medical side of the sport is all under the guise of medical treatment. And you're told that, for instance, in my first exam, after when I'm just meeting me, talking about my family's medical history and that my mother had contracted breast cancer, then I was told that I need to give a, I need to go through a testicular cancer exam screening and a prostate cancer exam screening. Now there's two things at play at that point. One, at 18, I didn't even know what a prostate was. And two, I didn't want cancer. Because almost simultaneously, when I started getting recruited by the University of Michigan, when Les Miles came on my campus at my high school, my mother had been diagnosed with breast cancer. So the last thing I wanted was breast cancer or cancer. So you need to do a screening to see that I don't have cancer? Absolutely. Because this doctor also checked you off to be able to play. So there are, and because it happened to offensive linemen, defensive linemen, quarterbacks, running backs, tight ends, it happened to so many people, hockey players, that I personally know because it was normalized that you're at Michigan and this is the doctor that you must see to get certified that you can play.
or that you could practice. So you don't know what you don't know. And it's the Michigan way. It's you're different. And you think that, oh, well, this is just a normal exam. Because also growing up, the only time I went to the doctor was to get a physical to be able to play football or to play soccer or to run track. You had to get a physical to play that year. So it's also been normalized that to play sports at the youth level, you must get a physical. If the plays and the competition are higher, then one could assume that everything, class, you're living you know, away from home, everything is at a higher level. And so you never questioned the things that were within the organization because it's not McClure North High School in Florissant, Missouri, where I played 5A sports. This is Michigan. And in the cases that have happened where an athlete that had been abused by Anderson actually spoke up and told the coach of the abuse and broke out of that normalization for five seconds and his scholarship was immediately, oh, sorry, he was kicked off the team. So you have that case as well as people speaking up, scholarships are threatened. They might not be kicked off the team, but there's the fear of losing your place at the university, losing your career, potential career in the NFL, losing your education and your path in life. And having the pressure of disappointing your family or your community or your entire lineage. I was the first person in my entire family that played big time college sports at the highest level. Did your mom Michigan. get to go to your, your games? My mom went to a few games. Um, but, you know, that's, that, that's a huge weight on an 18-year-old. Mm. The pressure of your family and your community to not disappoint them. To not be sent home as a failure. So the pressure to succeed at 18 is higher than most people will ever experience in their daily life. Because you also have to look at the percentage of people that play football in high school that actually get to play football at college and then an even smaller percent that get to play in the pros. So you're talking about the elite of the elite. You know, there's, you know, 7 billion people on the face of the earth, seven plus. So imagine, you know, there's not that many people athletically blessed to play big time college football. In every recruiting class, there's 20, 25, 20 to 30 players, you know? So it's not like there are, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of pool. The pool shrinks because of the level of competition. And, and you realize that, you know, you realize that this is not high school from day one. The minute you step on campus and see the facilities, talk to the coaches and meet other players and see, you know, the doctor, the tra like every the dorms, everything is at a level that is unlike what you're accustomed to growing up. And the fact that you're probably living away from home for the first time in your life. John, we've covered a lot of territory today and being conscious of your time. Um, why don't a uh, couple things coming up? You have so much on your plate right now. Uh, I, I've talked to you about writing, you're writing a book. You have a surgery coming up. I'd like to know how how we can how we can uh, how we can support any events um, your protest tell us just very quickly what you have coming up for us how we can follow you connect and continue supporting all these journeys 
Um, man, there's so many things. Uh, and, and, and it's not just me protesting. And one of our supporters and a good friend who's in sexual assault advocacy out of South Carolina created a GoFundMe, um, which has helped tremendously because we've got, you know, sometimes six, seven, eight, 15 guys out there uh, in tents or whatever, and, you know, it helps with food and just provisions. It's, you know, it's gotten down as low as like two degrees. Uh, so that's one way um, I share with you that link and you can share with your audience. Um, get the word out. Um, I think we've worked diligently to have these conversations on the national and international level because Michigan is the number one public institution in the world. So the world needs to understand what's going on as pertains to this atrocity. Um, I am launching uh, the website, hailtothevictims.com um, because I, uh, me and um, a producer and a director, uh, we're just finishing up the editing process of a short film that um, will be released uh, first part of February, like in those first couple of days of February, which gives a deeper dive into this fight, why we fight, and um, why I chose um, the geographical location of taking this fight uh, to University of Michigan um, at the president's house, as well as just become aware. And I, and, I, and, and, and on a, a micro level, when someone tells you about the abuse that they suffered, believe them. That's one of the hardest things for sufferers of abuse and rape, sexual assault is to not be believed. Uh, being a survivor of sexual assault sexual abuse is like what I call the ever shrinking island because there's the shame, there's the grief, there's the pain, there's the loneliness and that island um, continues to shrink. And these organizations love to separate and keep you alone. And I think there is a voice that is starting to uprise in the world to say no more. And the solidarity that you're seeing with not only survivors, but supporters of survivors is getting loud mm -hmm. and it's getting strong. And we must come together as a community to bring back the safety of, you know, when you think of, there's really only two things that the majority of the world get into that are extremely pure. That's music and that's sports. And in regards to sports, most of us get into different sports because our buddies or our friends are playing when we're very at a very young age. And it was just to hang out with our, 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 my best friend or our buddies. And so let's bring back the purity in youth sports. And um, we're using this fight at Michigan uh, to give you an example of what the worst can be. But we still have hope that we can restore Michigan to truly being leaders and best. Speaking of hope, John, <clears throat> you are a river of hope and your voice represents true progress and change. And um, it's been a real honor to have you here today. And we're very fortunate that we have had the chance to listen to you and learn so much and relearn um, more importantly. Yeah, Thank you for being here. Process. Sure. Uh, no, thank you. And on behalf of survivors everywhere, hail to the victims. And hail to the victims. We stand together. I really appreciate your time on behalf of many, many people that need to hear your voice. No, and thank you. Um, we stand in solidarity. We will no longer be faceless, nameless, or voiceless victims. I am not John Doe. I am John Barnes.